talk about land arts, we're going to cover a lot of ground and move pretty fast. Everybody, please fasten your seat belts. We're going to begin with the words of Buckminster Fuller. Not until I was four years old in 1899 was it discovered that my cross-eyedness was caused by my being abnormally farsighted. Lenses fully corrected my vision. Despite my new ability to apprehend details, my childhood's spontaneous dependence only upon big patterns has persisted. We still have a lot to learn from Bucky's reading of the big patterns. The Spiral Jetty by Robert Smithson is not a picture. It's certainly not static. It's a lens focusing on what's around to larger conditions, like the very near oil exploration jetty to the south and its traces of industrial production and failure to presence and absence. Ultimately, it's about a material, about rocks, salt, and water. And it's about a walk, an experience. This brings to, the, to mind the writing of the architect Yohani Palazma and his distinction between the image of a door and the act of passing through it. Or put yet another way in the words of the late great Towns Van Zandt, you cannot count the miles until you feel them. Land arts is essentially a semester abroad in our own backyard. We link the pedagogic value of travel and field work with, to investigate the American landscape. The world is our classroom. And how we move through it is part of the conversation. We connect pre-contact settlements with contemporary earthworks. Some existing only as faint traces. Some you're not even allowed to photograph, but you can draw. We connect scientific research installations with military and industrial land use. But most importantly, we're out there to connect this experience to our work. Students make no trace interventions in the particular landscapes we inhabit. And this is a full body experience, for some much more so than others. <laughs> to help us interpret the places that we visit, we, we invite field guests to join us, people like art historian Ann Reynolds, artist Joan Jonas, Center for Land Use Interpretation Director Matt Coolidge, Simpark Director Steve Badgett, writer and curator Lucy Lepard, and remote studio director Lori Riker, to name just a few. Impelled by the logic of survival, we become a community in the field. The, the shape of our interaction takes many forms and brings us to all sorts of places. We're as captivated by the discarded big gulp cup as the cow skull. The traces of human action that we encounter run from minor to major. That sticker on the Trinity site sign contains a Howard Zinn quote that reads, there is no flag large enough to cover the shame of killing innocent people. Ultimately, land arts is about time and space, about the nature of a journey, complete with what it means to live on the road, <laughs> including all of its obstacles. I like to think of obstacles as opportunities. Go. What's going on? The fans are going out of control. <laughs> and Jen got her van stuck here. Uh, and, and it 
we got it out with a combination of sticks and might. And then Chris Taylor's about to blow through this and see if he cannot get stuck. So this is the third and final van. It's not a competition, and sometimes we do have to call for backup. So. <laughs> so what brings us out here are the historic earthworks, like Michael Heiser's double negative. He made this sculpture in 1969 out of space, out of void, out of volume. And we're here to, to examine it, and I think it's actually a stronger work today because of its interaction with time and erosion. It begs the question of, will this be legible as a human mark in another 40 years? With that question, in 2009, we arrived with a laser scanner to collect point clouds of data, millions of points, to capture a, a very accurate three-dimensional um, model of, of the configuration of the work at 40 years old. Our itinerary brings us through communities as well as remote sites, places like Wendover, Utah, because of its place in atomic history. We're also there to work with the Center for Land Use Interpretation. They maintain a series of exhibition and residency facilities there. During World War II, Wendover was the site of the largest Army Air training base. Now, it's an active ruin, complete with all of the human erosion that, that accompanies that. Here, the military <clears throat> developed and, and tested the methods for deploying the fruit of the Manhattan Project. This seemingly empty landscape, the Great Salt Lake Desert, attracts things that like emptiness. It's a highly industrialized landscape. The evap evaporative mineral extraction of intrepid potash is one example. But for us, our time out in Wendover is about getting out onto the flats to make our work. This is a fascinating landscape where it's easy to become lost between ground and sky. To help us with this problem, we've been visited by Bill Fox, who likes to write about the breakdown of human logic that occurs in isotropic spaces spaces that are the same in all directions. Bill says things like, it's impossible to walk a straight line on the Bonneville Salt Flats. And given my nature, my attitude is, I'm going to fix my eye on that point in the far distance, and I can do this and prove him wrong. And then I turn around and realize my footprints show me that I'm the one that's in error. This sort of empirical feedback is essential to land arts. And it allows us to see things like the Bonneville Dyke as the truly monumental lines in the landscape that they are, 12 miles long and dead level. It puts into perspective the large holes and long lines on the planet. We can read the bathtub ring at Lake Mead as a monumental drawing and as an indicator of drought. For some, like the artist Nancy Holt, these lines connect out from ourselves to celestial events in the sky. Each fall, we depart from Texas Tech, traveling about 6,000 miles over, overland, camping for two months. Our operation fits into two vans, one for gear, the other for people. Both are very tightly packed. <laughs> we, we generate our own electricity from the sun with photovoltaic panels on the roof of one of the vans. We build our own infrastructure. And over the years, our cook tent has evolved considerably. Drawing always helps to make sense of things. This is also a shady place to prepare for evening seminars and to make work. We like to think of this as our mobile bunker, attempting to protect us from the elements. However, sometimes uh, the system fails and we lose our battle with the wind. This is always fun to return to camp to, and we have, much, we have more than once. Our kitchen is elemental. We found it's pretty important for people to eat well in the field. We haul our own water, try to keep our utensils reasonably clean, the snack bin well stocked. Inspired by the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia, we acquired some folding beer garden tables in the last few years, and it had a profound effect on our conversation as well as our cooking. We visit Chaco Canyon because of the shift it registers in human settlement in the region, a, a concentration of resources and energy to build on a scale previously not attempted in the West. And we're as interested in, in the stories and how they're told as in what remains on the ground. Actually, the history of land art is ripe with examples where concentration of resources happen, as well as trying to find our place in the world by looking at the sky. <clears throat> uh, 
Actually, most landscapes, if you really look, provide more questions than they answer. That otherworldly gray thing in the center of this image is not a mirage. It's a capped pile of uranium tailings on the Navajo Nation. We have visited the jackpile mine at Laguna Pueblo. From the 1950s to the 1980s, this was the largest open pit uranium mine in North America. And we're here with Curtis Francisco, a geologist and Laguna native, who helps us understand the magnitude of environmental um, situations that remain here. An essential piece of land arts is putting ourselves into the picture, ideally through our work, measuring aspects of place, persona, memory. Readings punctuate uh, our travels with campfire seminars, and these conversations are measured by other forms of readings of time and space. The responses have covered a profoundly diverse range over the years, while often stemming from a common impulse. All of it requiring a considerable amount of personal investment, material performance, primary experience that occurs in many, many different kind of forms, even architecture and documentation. At the end of our field season, we, we create an exhibition, and it's important for students to translate their experiences in the field back to conditions back in the gallery to, to, to larger audiences. In the end, we fail that this has just been a great camping trip. How we return to, in Robert Smithson's terms, from site to non-site is how we re-enter and help shape culture. We also do this by extending our long table dinners to celebrate the exhibition and include the students' family and other faculty. So this effect, this, the effect of this experience had, lasts long into the future for its participants. And as we near the end of this journey here tonight, let's return to the spiral jetty and the space between image, mediated experience, temporal afterglow, cycling again and again to consider that space between ground and sky, the receding horizon, the blue of distance, as Rebecca Solnit refers to it. Because even though Smithson says that future tends to be prehistoric, the response from the students is not one of retreating or closing down. Instead, outward momentum persists, and we return to Bucky's big patterns and the vast terrain of how humanity has made land into landscape. Thank you.